everybody. Welcome to Bite of Learning. Thank you for coming. Today we have Professor Jackie Wernemont from Scripps College. And she's going to tell us a little bit about the field of digital humanities and then about an effort at the library to create a consortial center for the digital humanities. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to, just as a, a bit of preface, um, I'm going to move through some examples of, of digital humanities work rather quickly um, so that we can get to a conversation about what the center might look like um, in the planning stages of the Mellon Grant, um, where we have a Mellon planning grant right now, um, to sort of scope out what uh, a digital humanities center for the library that serves the consortium but that also has regional collaboration might look like. Um, but if there are particular things that people want to go back to, um, I'm happy to switch back during the Q&A. This is also, um, at the end of this, there's a, a link to a, a, an open Google Doc, so anyone can go and use it, uh, use the links, etc. All right, so the title is This Digital Humanities, which is not one. Um, it might be a title that's too cute by half. Um, people are like, what is that, Jackie? What does that mean? Um, but it's taken from um, Jamie Sky Bianco's article in DH Debate. This is the title that she has for an article in which she's talking about um, feminist interventions in digital humanities. And it borrows its sort of structure from a rigorized, loose, loose a rigorized, um, this sex which is not one. So it's a, a kind of turn of phrase um, that Jamie was particularly interested in. And the reason that I like it is because it speaks to the plurality of digital humanities. Um, people always say to me, Jackie, what is digital humanities? And I say, that's actually not the right question. It's what are the digital humanities? Um, so a bit of a provocation to start off. Stanley Fish, who is a cultural critic and literary scholar who writes now for the New York Times, uh, last year was part of a conversation in which people were sort of excited about or vexed by digital humanities. And he said, a new generation of digitally savvy humanists have arisen, suggesting that we are now working in a post-theoretical world. And he called this group of scholars a new insurgency. And Fish was particularly interested in sort of positing a fight between old and new literary scholars and cultural critics. Um, but he's part of a, a broader sort of sense that there's been a major shift in the academy such that people are now funding digital humanities, students are very excited about digital humanities, but people aren't really sure what it is. And there's also this sense that it's brand spanking new. People often cite the fact that the NEH um, Office of Digital Humanities started five or six years ago as evidence that this is a brand new field, when in fact most digital humanities scholars would trace its origins back about 60 years to the work of um, Father Roberto Busa in a field known as humanities computing. And he was doing a computer compile, compiled concordance to the works of Thomas Aquinas. Now, there's a, a thing called the Day of DH, um, which is a, a sort of online event to highlight the work of digital humanities scholars. One of the things that the Day of DH asks of all of the scholars who participate is that we define what digital humanities means to us, because it's so plural. So Rebecca Davis, who's a director at Knightley, which is the National Institute for Technology and Liberal Education, of which Harvey Bunn is a member, defines digital humanities as all the ways that the humanities and digital technologies intersect. For me, this definition is helpful as shorthand, but it's way too baggy. This is a lot of things. There are a lot of things that can fit into Rebecca's definition. And she is using that strategically because she's, Knightley is an advocacy group. It was funded by Mellon in order to sort of promulgate digital technologies in liberal education. A definition that works a little bit better for me, partly because um, I kind of cut my digital humanities teeth working under Julia Flanders, is this. Digital humanities is the critical study of how the technologies and techniques associated with the digital medium intersect with and alter humanities scholarship and scholarly communication. Longer, bit wordier, but for me it sort of gets at the interplay between humanities questions and technology, that it's not just that the technology serves humanistic inquiry, but that the two sort of inflect each other. Often people have a, a, a sort of completion in their head um, or a set of confusions about digital humanities and its relationship to digital pedagogy. And I distinguish between the two of them as a kind of heuristic. It's useful to distinguish them. There's a lot of overlap. Um, but digital pedagogy can apply across divisions. Um, it often, given the pedagogy, reflects focuses on a reflective teaching practice. And it, you see things like 
MOOCs, the massively open online courses, or the feminist version of this, a distributed open online course, um, using some of the technologies to think about how education can happen at a kind of distance. Um, things like clickers in classrooms might be an instance of digital technology in a classroom that isn't digital humanities. But it's not sort of thinking about the way that a clicker affects the kinds of questions that we ask in that room. Digital, and I should say, when it can apply across the divisions, right? Clickers show up in biology classrooms, they can show up in social science classrooms, they can show up in digital humanities should be, and I say this with a caveat, dealing strictly with the humanities. This is problematic, right, because there's a lot of digital history going on, very, very interesting work, a lot of um, digital mapping going on. Both of those tend to fall more in the social science divisions, so the demarcation isn't super clear. I will acknowledge that digital humanities work doesn't have to deal with teaching per se. Uh, there are a lot of really um, well-known digital humanities scholars who aren't particularly interested in bringing their work into the undergraduate classroom. The sort of filtering down into the graduate level work has happened. Um, undergraduate classrooms, undergraduate certificates in digital humanities, things like that, have taken a bit more time. Um, I think it's important, but not everybody does it. Um, what digital humanities work in a classroom should do is ask students to think about how the tools change the kinds of questions they're asking. So to give you a couple of examples, I have about a half a dozen different examples so you can see sort of the breadth of the field, and this is not exhausted by any stretch of the imagination. The short title catalog and the wing catalogs are catalogs of early, modern, and enlightenment printing, um, mostly in English, although not exclusively. Um, they were all microfilmed some number of years ago, and beginning in 1998, um, Chadwick Healy set up Evo, Early English Books Online, in order to offer digital surrogates of those texts, making them available to a broad range of scholars. The text creation partnership with the University of Michigan started in 1999, and the production of full text, um, hand transcribed versions of these digital surrogates. So these are PDFs, and then where there is a full text version that um, exists alongside in the citation. You have things like thematic archives, um, Valley of the Shadows, which is Ed Ayer's project at UVA is an example. This is a Civil War archive. You can see that they have a kind of spatial and temporal interface here. What you do is you click on, say, soldier records, and it will take you into the soldier records of that particular period. You can look at letters and diaries alongside. Um, you also have thematic archives that are according to things like gender. This is the Women Writers Online archive. Uh, this is their new interface over here on the left side. You see a set of texts. There are over 700 texts in the, in the text space right now. Um, a set of texts based on a set of filters over here. Um, you have a, a kind of mapping, time mapping visualization that shows where those texts fall on the timeline. And then here you have the full text version. Um, and everything in the WWO is hand transcribed and full text. You also get things like critical manuscript editions. This has been a really big deal for people in classics, in religious studies, in some of the language programs, um, medieval and early modern literature, where you get reproductions or digital surrogates, high quality images of rare book or manuscript materials. And this is actually a, um, like a recipe book, and this is the table of contents for it. Um, and this book of ordinance has you know, they're probably 600 pages or something. But this image is of high enough quality that someone who can read that hand would actually be able to do a scholarship on it. But it's also really great, this is at the Scriptorium project, um, as a classroom tool, because alongside those high quality images which you see here, they have all of the metadata, but then also a transcription of the text, right? So for a, an undergraduate student who isn't going to be conversant in medieval hand, you have the full text transcribed. Although I'll, I'll note, right, it's got um, it's preserved early modern spellings and other sort of idiosyncratic things. You get a different kind of recovery project in something like the Archimedes Palimpsest project. This here is a 13th century prayer text. This here is the underlying um, Archimedes mathematical text. So a palimpsest is a text where another text has been laid over the top in some way. So if you look Right now at this book, what you see is this, this 13th century prayer text. You previously could not get at the Archimedes text without destroying that top text. 
they developed a multispectral um, image analysis um, procedure, which allowed them to see the underlying text, which includes previously unknown Archimedes mathematical treatises. Um, you also get things um, that are known as born digital projects. That is, projects that rather than providing digital surrogates, like all of the previous examples, create in digital media new literary or multimedia texts. So um, electronic literature and digital poetics are both areas of this, and I'm going to show you this example really quickly. Um, Olipo is a, a group in France that's doing a kind of um, poetry engine using computational technologies. Um, the Wilderness Downtown is this fantastic music video that uses GPS technology to find your house to give you a kind of personalized music video. And this um, multimedia poetry, the Tao, is a collaboration um, with uh, Sondheim and Strasser. Let me just listen real quick. Um, Angel Inez is the director of that at Hamilton College. 
Um, it's both an archive and a 3D environment. Um, the Soweto uprisings in 1976 in South Africa were rather um, violent, and uh, part of what Angel's project is to both recover the spatial experience of a, a community that was raised after the um, uprisings, but also to provide a kind of community interface with the digital memory box. So people who were there can contribute um, memories, essentially. They can write narratives, they can include photographs, etc. But students can also um, edit and um, author items that would go in this digital memory box. You get um, also some rather high-tech projects, like the virtual reconstruction of Arnie Flatten's Ashes to Art project, which is coming out of Coastal Carolina. This is a project in which um, students, it's a, a kind of intersection of religious studies, archaeology, and then digital media. Students are creating these 3D virtual renderings of archaeological sites. This is the Temple of Athena, um, for example. Um, they're using data from live archaeological digs. The students can repeat this class for credit as many times as they'd like. And those who do particularly well get to go along with Arnie on those digs. Um, everything on his website is completely student generated, from the design of the website to the 3D visualizations to the historical or historiographic content. Um, Arnie's actually quite frank in saying that he doesn't really know how to do this kind of um, graphic creation. So the students are learning in the classroom, and when he came to talk last year, part of what he said to us is that a student might spend an entire semester just building that column, and that has to be a, an acceptable outcome for that class. All right, so defining a digital humanities center. That's sort of like a quick and dirty overview of things that might show up in digital humanities work. A digital humanities center, according to the clear publication that came out as a survey of digital humanities centers, is an entity where new media and technologies are used for humanities-based research, teaching, and intellectual engagement and experimentation. The goal of the center are the goals are to further humanities scholarship, create new forms of knowledge, and explore technology's impact on humanities-based disciplines. This is a pretty satisfying definition for me. The challenge is that there are really lots of different ways to sort of enact that on the ground. So I've sort of described it as 31 flavors here. Um, just to give you a quick overview, this is um, a kind of come one, come all mega center. Um, extraordinarily extraordinarily well-funded, things like the Maryland Institute of Technology and, Technology and Humanities, um, or the UVA Scholars Lab, are these kinds of projects, or these kinds of centers, where what they're doing is fostering multiple different sort of small research-driven projects. They don't have a single identity. They, they sort of support faculty research in a number of different areas. By contrast, you could have something like the Center for History and New Media, um, which actually does something very different. It focuses specifically on digital history, right? They're not doing literary projects, they're not doing GIS as it sort of happens outside of historiographic research. So they have a kind of disciplinary focus. But you also get boutique projects, things like translations of Diderot's texts, right? Where this is something that a single class is doing. Or cross-institutional projects that aren't necessarily aligned with the center, but sort of exist across spaces, like the real face of white Australia, this project is, is really fascinating. They're using um, facial recognition technology to scan through the entire national records office for Australia. And the reason they're doing that is to sort of give face, literally, to what was understood as whiteness in Australia, but was in fact a rather multiracial kind of um, community. So there are lots of, if there's lots of different ways to do digital humanities, there are a number of different ways to do a digital humanities center. Um, there are a handful of other places where people are undertaking regional efforts like we would do. Or like we're talking about doing. <coughs> and these are all funded um, by Mellon. So Mellon is particularly interested in this kind of work. The New York Six group um, is sort of just getting off the ground. The five colleges has a, a slightly more robust sort of um, mode of interaction, but this is still really um, kind of ad hoc faculty gatherings. Um, there is someone who organizes them. 
sort of oversees them, is, is designed, their, their job is to foster those kinds of relationships, but it hasn't really found its way into classrooms in any kind of systematic way yet. Um, I will say that um, for our part, part of what we bring to the table that hasn't been done yet is collaboration between liberal arts colleges and R1 institutions, major research hubs. That's something that the digital humanities community has really struggled with. Um, R1s have significantly more technical, personal, monetary resources than we do. Um, and there hasn't yet been a model of collaboration between LACs and R1s, and that's something that we're hoping to do, um, particularly with USC. So, these are proposed areas of strategic focus. Things are very much, I'm gonna go over the sort of timeline for the Digital Humanities Center, but things are still very much in the speculative phase right now. They won't um, get concrete for probably a couple of months. So, rather than doing a come one, come all model, which would require us to be more well-funded than we could possibly be, and rather than doing a single disciplinary model which would restrict the scope of engagement, um, what we're proposing is to think about relationships between the digital and material, and to think about what's known as vibrant or ethical data. And the idea here with these two sort of thematic groups is that it would allow faculty to generate research questions, research projects that, are, that intersect with these areas, but that aren't sort of driven by a single person's agenda or a sort of identity. Um, this is again a kind of proposal. Um, we would like to think of the center as a place that incubates and facilitates advanced and undergraduate research clusters in digital humanities. We are thinking about operating a digital humanities clinic, much on the model of the engineering clinics here at MUD, um, which rather than supporting outside um, corporate interests, would support our grant projects. Um, the CCDH staff would be available to consult on external grants and where approved um, might house and contribute to those projects. So future NEH projects, things like that. Um, I said there are research clusters. Uh, the idea right now is that in partnership with USC, we would have a call for faculty to propose research clusters. They would be competitively funded. They would have a term of one to four semesters. And they would include Southland faculty, staff, um, especially technical staff, graduate students, and undergraduate students. So we see this as a kind of um, vertical integration of the entire community in participating in active research. Um, we hope that faculty um, would be available or would be eligible for course release. Um, we're thinking about needing to have at least two campuses represented. Um, what the mechanics of that would be have not yet sort of been um, worked out. We'd also like to see undergraduates, perhaps, being able to propose research clusters um, across the campuses, allow sort of ideas to bubble up out of their interests and then work with faculty. Uh, other ideas that have come up, um, possible post baccalaureate opportunities for our students at USC, uh, the Institute for Media, Multimedia Literacy, um, possibly using USC postdocs as replacements for faculty leaders here in Claremont. Um, as I said, the clinic, which would support projects, and then I'm actively soliciting other ideas. Um, our timeline. So it's the fall. We're having these conversations. We're doing some infrastructure surveys, thinking about what technical capacity we do have, what um, expertise capacity we already have. Um, we've been doing site visits, things like uh, the MIT Media Lab, um, the Hyper Studio there. We've been down to USC, to UCLA, et cetera, to see what places look like, um, since we're talking about a space in the library, um, and sort of define the scope for the center and its collaborations. The spring would be when we would actually write the grant, um, and we would establish a firm collaborative infrastructure and work with a design team on the space. And then, over the summer, we would have those melon conversations, and the formal grant request would go before the board in September 2013, and ideally the grant would be funded um, January 2014. That was like a whirlwind, right? In 22 minutes, that's crazy. Um, what kinds of questions can I answer for you? Um, what kinds of ideas do you have? What kinds of things would you need to know to have an idea? Etc. Yeah. Could you repeat the, uh, the clustering requirement that 
Yeah, so this is um, entirely a proposal, right? We have not said, like, this is how the clusters must go. But what we're thinking is that they would need to have faculty, at least one faculty member from the Claremont Colleges, and one faculty member from USC. And they would propose a research cluster of some kind that would then, when they got that cluster funded, there would be money to support graduate students, money to support undergraduate RAs, and money hopefully to support faculty release so that they can think those great thoughts or build whatever it is that they're going to build. So USC is a pretty big place. Uh, which departments are you really engaged with? Um, so we are most closely engaged with the people at the Institute for Multimedia Literacy. Um, and they're in the School of Cinematic Arts, which is like a particular program. That said, um, the conversations with the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities um, have been very positive, and it seems like they are in support of um, uh, collaborations that arise spontaneously, right, rather than forced collaborations. The mechanics of that, I don't yet have sorted out, um, but it's, that's what we're aiming for. Well, for a semester. Mm, I don't. I mean, it's a. It would depend on the kinds of projects, right? So, if we had lots of um, grant requests for one semester projects versus for four semester projects, it would change things, right? Um, I don't anticipate that the staff could support more than three or four active projects at a time in these first three years. So, the idea, the the funding cycle for Mellon is a, a three-year funding cycle, and the idea is that we would go back for a second grant request so that the center would have a six-year sort of scope, and that um, that second request would allow us to build further capacity based on the success of projects um, in that first, honestly, that first two and a half years, mm -hmm. right, because you have to start writing projects. So, um, relatively small. Yeah, I'm here, I'm here a bit late, so I might be missed the I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I have the din of the dining room. Could okay. you start again? I miss, I may be missed the sure, sure. thing, but there's a lot of historic pastoral archives out there and how the people speak in Europe or from the other uh, others. Try one more time. Sorry. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking your research um, focus on the digital archive or digital library pathway. So my, I work on digital archives, but that's not what the center would be focused yeah, on. I miss, I miss probably. <laughs> yeah, so the center um, actually, whether or not I'm in charge of it, um, that remains to be determined, um, would have areas of strategic focus that aren't the same as my personal research. Um, so these two areas, relationships between the digital material, very broadly conceived, and then the sort of broad concept of vibrant or ethical data. And these are, again, just proposed areas of focus right now. So you are not specifically focusing on one subject? No. No, we are specifically not doing that because I think it would exclude too many people in the community. But that didn't mean to trying to be a digital repository, um, right? The, the library as a digital repository for scholarship, that's, that's one thing, but the center is not sort of attempting to build a thematic archive or anything like that. Research projects might engage with archives that exist out there, but we aren't proposing to create one. A research project might propose to create one, but that's not what the center is saying its agenda would be necessary. Yeah. So how would, um, how would Harvey Mudd interface with this center in terms of faculty and staff and students? What do you think? Is, this, is, is the center going to be entirely new employees? Are they going to be fucked from well, colleges? I mean, when we think about center staff, I mean, we're talking like three people. Right, we're not talking about a lot of people. Um, I think the, the person that we probably most have to have and will cost us the most is a dedicated developer, um, someone who does humanities style programming. Um, that said, um, you know, I think integration with 
local um, teaching and learning sort of initiatives is going to be important, although I don't know the mechanics of that. Um, integration with local IT important, but I don't know the mechanics of that. I mean, one of the challenges is, is trying to figure out, we can't ask the ITs of the different colleges to take on more because they're already overtasked. Um, so that's something that the center is going to have to do itself. Um, but that's going to have to interface with the, the sort of local IT communities. Um, in terms of students, I can see lots of places where MUD students might engage. Um, I think the clinic is a really interesting place for CS students, um, maybe information engineering students, to get some work doing the kinds of things that they're thinking about. Um, I myself work on mathematics and poetry, so I can see mathematics students from MUD and elsewhere. I mean, I'm already working with two from Pomona um, to sort of think about questions. So it would depend on the research clusters. Um, I think, you know, there are lots of ways in which I can imagine an undergraduate wanting to sort of have some work in a humanities research lab, um, right, that may or may not relate to their work. Students work in all kinds of places. Um, as for the faculty, I think there's a lot of different opportunities. Um, and I don't think it's just for the humanities faculty. For the biologist in the room, there's a thing at MIF this year on the relationship between bioinformatics and digital humanities. Right, so this big data is actually sort of a, a, an interdisciplinary thing. Um, so I can imagine that there might be places for new place there. Okay. Is there the intention of having the Claremont Hall just generate data for similar types of data array? Um, so if you mean generate data by um, all of the data of projects would be open and accessible, then yes. Um, and we don't, we aren't aiming to have a closed shop. Um, I think open access principles will guide the center um, insofar as we've been talking about it thus far. Will we be sort of like contracting out as data producers? Probably not, but we'd be happy to share our data with people who wanted to. I see it. I know Rachel, you had another question. Uh, I'm just wondering how this would work in terms of a lot of these projects seem to be multi-year yep. projects that, uh, you know, you, you create some kind of archive and uh, software to guide you through materials that are inside it. But then there are, as you assume, years of data entry that mm -hmm. go into creating some of these things. Mm -hmm. so, I guess the question is what what does the <laughs> the center do versus you know what how, how do you sustain a long term project I guess is the so the center I mean insofar as that that sort of mission statement said that it would incubate um, very much has to be a kind of launching pad for if if they're going to be long term projects right there are short term projects um, people who are doing digital publications digital arts, right, there, there can be short-term projects, but you're right that some of these are much longer term. And we can't be the funding source for that, right? So what we can do is get a project started, think about proof of concept, um, walk them through an NEH grant process, and then be a locus for that NEH grant to be administered. Now, that would include writing in programming staff, project management staff, etc. that would be part of the grant, not and they might work at the center, but they wouldn't be center staff. Um, so the center can't possibly sustain the long-term projects. It has to be a place where they get developed and then maybe live with outside funding. What do you think about um, corporate sponsorship? I mean, you did, you did say this could be like clinics, ex except without the, the external corporation. But I'm thinking of Google and Microsoft, which have initiatives in terms of visualizing data. Yeah. So um, thus far, Google and Microsoft seem to not necessarily need places like us, right? Um, but I will say that this vibrant data project is something that's funded out of Intel Labs. Um, and I have absolutely no objection to working with Intel to think about ethical uses of data. Um, that the clinic would support research projects rather than, right, like 
they don't need undergraduate programmers to do work for Intel. Like that's not, that's never gonna happen. Um, so that, that clinic face would be, it would face inward rather than outward. Um, I personally don't object to corporate funding, but I think that's something that has to be decided by a group bigger than me. And certainly if someone came in with a project that was funded by a corporation and wanted our support, I, I don't see how I could possibly say no. I just, I, I just feel like this, the corporations are sometimes the sources of the, the leading technologies yes. that humanists could use mm -hmm. and, and to create more connections between those different worlds would yep. be, in this oh. case, kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, we have a Skype with the vibrant data people in the police. So, just none of those. I saw your hand. So I was going to say, actually, Intel does use student programmers Do they? on the clinic projects. Oh, cool. Very much. That I didn't know. So. I mean, I think one of the reasons that we had thought about the, the clinic as a, a way of having, um, so the, the most expensive thing for digital humanities projects is programming, universally, it seems like. Um, and to be able to have a sort of shop out of which we could get good programming work, but also get students' experience in humanities-based research seems very desirable. Um, so that's, in addition to not knowing that Intel used undergraduate programmers, um, that's our major motivation. Yeah. Thank you. And so every, everything you've mentioned so far has um, an assumption that the project will go on. And it would be very important for the center to say lots of our projects will just go away. Yes. Yeah. And, and fill that in right in the Yes. Yeah, no, I agree. I actually don't, I mean, I think thinking about how we could sustain projects or what our role would be in sustaining is important, but I don't assume that they would succeed, that they would actually result in something showable. Um, I think failure is a perfectly acceptable outcome for these kinds of projects. The challenge for us, very pragmatically, will be that we can't have all of our projects fail if we want them to give us more money. <laughs> right, so the projects will have to be selected with an eye towards getting more money to be worth the frame, at least some. Do you guys, it, it, I mean, there's a, a wide range of people in this room. People see themselves wanting to propose something. Does this seem like the kind of thing that might Fly. I mean, this is so. When I say these are proposed areas, they they really are. Um, and I have. Things like the beer garden, which I think most of you missed, it's mm -hmm. awesome. The digital humanities beer garden, there will be more of them. Social event with good beer. Um, but this is my contact information. Um, I am happy to talk more, to think more, to receive your long rants and raves, um, et cetera, et cetera. I'm the, um, the PI on this grant, Allegra Gonzalez, who's the Center for Digital Initiatives librarian, and Sam Combe who is the R&D librarian at, at um, Honolulu Mud are both on the grant as well. Yeah? A very elementary question. Are you making the same presentation as today at the other dates that are on here? It will be similar, um, but not identical. So different, um, I mean, you don't need to come to all five of them, yeah. um, is the, the short answer of that. There will be different people asking different kinds of questions. Understood. Um, but yes, roughly the same. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.